So welcome to the ninth edition, the ninth episode of Coffee and Code. I'm Mark Franks, your host, and I, I'm here to welcome Ali Jani, our chief uh, product officer. And uh, we have a bunch of uh, uh, developer MVPs from our developer community. We have a few employees as well uh, that I invited to join us. And, you know, what I asked, you know, originally when I was fir- when we first were uh, doing coffee and code is I'd li- I wanted to have executives on periodically. And we the last executive we had was a joy. Uh, and now we have Ali. And in the future, we'll have probably Mike and John join us. So, Ali, I want to just uh, welcome you. Thank you for uh, joining us. And just want to kick things off with, you know, some background. You know, I hear you were a programmer once, uh, once in a, w- a long time ago. And and would like to, I'm sure a lot of the developers here would love to hear kind of your background uh, about, you know, how you started, you know, in your transition as sure. an executive at uh, Acumatica. Sure, sure. So you're going to make me show my age here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I am a computer science major uh, by uh uh, in, my, in my studies at school, and I went to Virginia Tech. But uh, before Virginia Tech, at a, as a very young age, uh, I was very much into electronics and loved to create gadgets and things like that. And uh, you know, created things like print buffers and you know, microcode on uh, chips and things like that. Uh, so those those types of things always fascinated me. But uh, when I got to about 16, I uh, wrote my first commercial product that uh, uh, that uh, was uh, sponsored by actually believe it or not by Paul Allen of uh, Microsoft um, you know back in the CPM days and DOS wasn't even out yet and uh, there was lots of uh, uh, you know 8-bit type computers and 6502 was the predominant uh, CPU in some of the uh, soft, you know, c- computers like you know Ataris and the Commodores and uh, those type of things, and of course, I got into the Apple II as well with the 68,000 Motorola chips and the, those types of things. So I was doing a lot of assembly code, and as a 16-year-old, I wrote my first uh, utility, the Norton Utilities before the Norton Utilities uh, back then, and I uh, got into this competition, and I won first place, and I got on stage with uh, uh, you know a few, few uh, thousand people, and Paul Allen uh, was kind enough to give me a big, nice check of sixty-four thousand dollars that I didn't know what to do with as a sixteen-year-old. <laughs> but uh, you know that was certainly fun. But you know, yeah, just tinkering and programming was something that uh, was always a passion for me. And then uh, it—I uh, was a double major in at school. In addition to my computer science, I did both uh, electrical engineering and computer science. So I have two diplomas hung up on my wall, and. Uh, and, and, you know, I always was fascinated with both. And as part of that, when I was in school, you know, my um, heritage and my uh, family were always entrepreneurs. My dad's been an entrepreneur, started up many, many small businesses, you know, from photography businesses to rug stores to import and export businesses. So I was always involved in trying to automate his business, right? He would always ask me, hey, you know, uh, how can I automate X, Y, and Z? Um, so I was always writing some kind of a software for business automation, even at a very early age when I was in um, in, in, in college. But uh, you know, during college, I um, was fascinated with uh, video technology, and at the time, um, you know, we didn't have anything like codecs or ABI files or any media files didn't exist. So um, I did a sponsorship. I did an internship with uh, Metro Graphics and Intel um, two years back to back. Intel was working on a uh, digital video interactive card that was a hardware based uh, video encoder uh, called DVI. And I got a chance to innovate there uh, in the summer and show off some of the codecs that I had written in software code. And we tried to put it into hardware at Intel, and we actually succeeded. So uh, back in the day, I remember, uh, if you all remember Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and you know those movies were uh, at the time, you know, rocking. And you know, I was able to uh, end-to-end encode the entire uh, movie and fit it onto a uh, 20 uh, megabyte hard drive. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was like these crazy things we had to do to make it fit. And 
and uh, be able to demonstrate that it's video is possible at the end of the day. So that was a lot of fun. So I, I learned quite a bit, uh, you know, in the field, you know, working at these different companies. Uh, my roommate at school had a, uh, his father had a video rental business. So we wrote a uh, rental software for checking in and checking out, you know, VHS videos that people would rent. And then we created this uh, Amazing kiosk is one of my projects at school uh, was way ahead of his time it was a touch screen. You know, you would walk up to it. Imagine you go to a blockbuster video type of a uh, video rental place and you'd walk up to the screen and you touch and you would see uh, videos of your movies that you liked and you could interact with it and say, show me movies with Harrison Ford. And it would uh, pull up, you know, scenes from from you know Indiana Jones and those type of movies and it would actually play using these DVI cards that uh, we work with at Intel and had disk changers. There was a 40 disk changer in this kiosk that would, uh, so both hardware and software just always fascinated me. And, um, and then, you know, uh, as I graduated, I knew that, uh, you know, I got to continue to build software. Uh, and I've always built software all my life, but, uh, you know, I got into, um, uh, in this idea of commercializing my doctor video product. So I went to work uh, building that. And in order to uh, make ends meet, I decided to uh, sell off some of my um, equipment that I had accumulated over time when I was at school, like computers that I built and put together. So it ended up being a big business by itself. I started a you know, Dell before the Dell Day computer type company. And we built a lot of, manufactured a lot of PCs. We were manufacturing something like 30,000 PCs a year um, at its peak when I sold the company in 2002 or something like that, uh, where I focused on hardware. But I think what I, learned, what I learned though in that process, when I ran that electronics or computer manufacturing company, you know, every minute of the day, I, I, I saw it as a distraction. You know, that running that business was a distraction because I always wanted to write code and I had to run this business to make ends meet. And I always got pulled into running the business. So uh, my entire goal was, how do I get that business to run by itself? And I can just focus on writing my video products and things that I was doing. So that kind of led me to into ERP world because I kept writing you know, sales tools to do negotiation, to do automatic estimating, to you know, do all these cool things that you know, salespeople would come to me and say, hey, can I uh, sell the computer to them at this price? So I'm like, well, why can't you figure it out? Well, I don't know what our cost is. I don't know what the profit is. So, you know, every single thing that I would do, I would try to automate that business. And that kind of gave birth to a product called Automator, which was the ERP before it's ERP. Uh, it didn't do any accounting. It connected to ACPAC and Solomon, you know, uh, for its accounting. But you know, eventually it continued to grow, and then I decided to write a product called Acquire, which brought in accounting. I was the sole coder with one other partner, so I wrote the entire ERP system by myself. Um, and it was a commercial product, and Acquire grew very quickly uh, into a company called iCode. And, um, and iCode uh, had something like 6,000 customers on Acquire using you know, uh, this ERP, mini ERP system. And then it uh, grew from there, and I continue to find other companies that uh, were into ERP. But to this day, believe it or not, I, I code regularly. I don't code uh, Acumatica. We know we have a lot of great developers like your community and our developers that do that. But from time to time, I look at the code. I learn about the code, what they're doing, what they're trying to accomplish. I do poke around. But I'm always on the side learning. You know, that's something that... I never stop. I'm constantly reading, you know, articles about everything um, and tinkering. If you saw my desk, you'd uh, be shocked on the number of electronic components I have and things that I work on and software systems. I have Visual Studio running right now with Visual Code running. And uh, so I'm always uh, uh, learning about new technologies and trying things out. I've got my own servers in my house, my own network environment, my own cloud. Uh, I have lots of uh, different clouds I work in with Google, with Amazon, and, and and so on. So I'm always in it. And you know, once you're a technology enthusiast, uh, you know, you you stay at it. But you know, I think what's changed quite a bit is, you know, I find myself uh, 
it's very difficult to learn everything these days, right? Before you used to be able to do learn about everything and anything. You could be expert at many, many things. And, you know, over time, uh, you just can't do that anymore. You have to find specialities that you focus on and you can only go so deep on uh, products if you, if you don't. But, I, but it, you know, I, I enjoy that because I don't have to go too deep. Uh, and I get to stay, you know, fairly on the surface level um, as an executive and but still being a, just knowing right right amount of uh, enough to challenge uh, folks and ask the right questions, but uh, but yeah, technology has always been my passion. So does anyone have any questions? We will ask all the way around that, and then we can you know we can ask product questions. We can ask you know more detail if you'd like. So anyone have any questions for Ali? I have one question. What is the the history and the relationship with Parallels and Acumatica? Yeah, so Acumatica's history is uh, quite interesting. Um, so, um, you know, the founders at uh, Acumatica, uh, you know, have a lot of ERP background. Um, um, and, you know, myself as well, you know, obviously with several prior ERP companies. But Parallels... Uh, was uh, basically our, our founder. Um, there was two partners, uh, Sergey Bolsov and uh, John Howe, who was our chairman of the board at the time. Um, John Howe had a lot of experience in the ERP world, was part of the Southeast Asia Solomon CEO. And uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, Parallels was growing leaps and bounds. And uh, uh, Acumatica was formed to build a uh, billing solution for Parallels because as Parallels continued to grow, it needed a lot of automation that typical ERP systems couldn't automate. So it was an internal project to uh, create a billing solution for par Parallels. And then Mike C and uh, some of the other folks got together, started to build uh, a billing solution. But as they did that, uh, they recognized that uh, uh, the world of infrastructure and parallels was more on the Linux side of the house versus uh, Microsoft and .NET. So they decided to branch out uh, that area and, you know, the billing solution kind of went away and it morphed into its own company. And with John Howell's background and Mike C's background working with John Howell, uh, you know, Acumata was kind of formed and uh, it was always separate. You know, and then, you know, since then, obviously, uh, we've completely separated from Parallels and the ownership has completely changed. But that's kind of the history behind Parallels. And in fact, Acumatica's uh, company name used to be called Project X because nobody knew what, what it was. <laughs> it was called Project X. And if you look at the source code and you see this PX libraries and PX, so now you know why that exists is actually called it was Project X, which uh, later on we renamed to Acumatica. Great. So Ali, from a technical perspective, what would you say you're most excited about for Acumatica and and what's what's in the some of the new technologies that are coming about? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know we're fortunate in the ERP space. Uh, things tend to move a little bit slower than other spaces, right? But the speed um, has picked up quite a bit in the last uh, three, four, five years. And, uh, and, and that, uh, because of the complexity and the na nature of businesses and them, their reluctance to change and how often they can do upgrades and you know, their absorption rate of, uh, uh, acceptance rate of uh, functionality and things like that, um, it's uh, played to our strengths in that you know, we're able to innovate much faster uh, than uh, in a, a traditional, uh, in other markets we do, we'd have to go much, much faster. But in ERP, compared to other ERP vendors, uh, we're just leaps and bounds ahead of them. Number one, because we've got uh, uh, more modern technology, um, you know, a lot of the ERP systems were created many, many, many decades ago. And uh, once you've got a large set of customers relying on a uh, technology. You always have to think about migration of those customers. So 
uh, projects like Project Green from Microsoft, where they wanted to consolidate, you know, many, many different ERP systems into one. You know, they have always failed because um, they have too many customers to deal with and to please everyone. It, it was a very difficult process. And asking people to switch completely without a migration is also a very challenging uh, proposition. So Acumatica is unique in that, you know, we were we didn't have a legacy customer to to uh, deal with. The technology had advanced to a point where it can um, be written for the cloud, so it was purpose built that way. And then, you know, we didn't have any uh, 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 investment equity. It was all private equity and private funding that allowed us to uh, focus on uh, infrastructure and platform and co the core components to truly build a platform first approach so that we can uh, dictate uh, the notion of this future proof. I mean, the reason I came to Acumatica, uh, you know, in my prior companies, you know, I had to rewrite the application many, many times. You know, we had to go from uh, CPM to DOS, from DOS to Windows, from Windows to Windows 95, from uh, COM to .NET, uh, and so on and so forth. So the technologies continue to change, and every time so the technology change, we had to throw away everything and start over again, in, in essence. So the, you know, when I saw, you know, where 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 uh, .NET had evolved to, where HTML5 had evolved to, uh, and potentially what we could build as a platform, um, it you know it excited me because it gave us an opportunity to truly separate the application layer from the platform layer, um, and to keep the platform fresh. Um, and uh, I think that's a big advantage for Acumatica because you know we're not just an applications company, ERP company, we're a platform company, and we can keep the platform fresh. So it'd be a good segue into that, is what are your thoughts with how Acumatica is promoting the low code, no code kind of paradigm? Yeah, that's a very good question because it's a double-edged sword, right? When you think about customizability, um, you know, and the power that we provide uh, um, the market with what they can do with Acumatica, right? Mm -hmm. You can shape and build any kind of a business application, and um, it's it's uh, open ended, you know, to to a large extent. Yeah, I mean, the system is aware of the changes you're making, so you know that's a big uh, advantage we have is because you you know even though we give you a lot of power, at least the system is aware of what you're doing, and we're able to introduce some control uh, in there. But still. Um, you know, that power comes with uh, uh, a lot of challenges if it's not used appropriately, right? It's, uh, you know, sometimes I use the analogy, way right or wrong, so, you know, people are going to get on me for saying this, but it's almost like uh, gun control, right? So, you know, you can, you know, give freedom to everybody and let them do what they want and uh, trust them to do the right thing, or... Uh, or you could just leave your gun out there and just, uh, you know, kids can end up shooting themselves, unfortunately. So, you know, we have this challenge that we have to think about the future and that if we want to scale as a company to 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 customers, uh, you know, how much control do we really, are we going to be able to continue to make contain? And can, can people uh, create faulty customizations can, could, could potentially be damaging to themselves. And can they damage others if it's an SaaS environment, especially? So uh, we're constantly thinking about, you know, how do we prevent uh, that? So we've got a lot of technologies like our resource manager that looks for things and can terminate processes, can uh, manage our SaaS environment, uh, but still give you some uh, power. But, uh, you know, we're always, uh, trying to innovate around that uh, and give that flexibility, but it comes with a lot of uh, pain. So, you know, ultimately, I do see that, uh, uh, you know, we're getting into an age where coding is not the ideal way to uh, uh, continue to thrive uh, if you're the business owner. Sure, you need to be able to rely on partners. That's why we have a channel, by the way. I mean, I think uh, having a channel uh, and reseller network helps us control that because the resellers, people like yourselves who are experts, can become that business partner for the customers and manage them, and the customer doesn't have to really see that. But, you know, the world is moving so fast that uh, customers want to be able to do things on their own. They don't want to necessarily be reliant on the partners as much. And the partners need to scale. And, you know, their 
they don't have as much time to be able to help the customers with every little thing that they want. So the more the system can do on its own, you know, uh, you know, some state in the future, you know, even code will be written by code, right? So uh, we've already seen that happening, but uh, you know, I still think we have some time before it gets uh, serious, uh, you know, uh, and puts us out of jobs. But uh, but in general, I think you know, uh, our business customers want to be able to do more on their own. They want to have more control, but they want to have controlled control. So that's where no code, low code comes in, uh, so that. We can give them as much power as we want uh, to move on to them, you know, allow them to put in some business rules, our business automation engines, our workflow engines, our UDFs, uh, uh, you know, Excel-like uh, power, you know, uh, type scripting codes and those type of things that help people even build new screens soon, uh, uh, so that they don't have to code to create screens and forms and collect data. Uh, so the more we can continue on that path and take them away from actually having to write code, uh, I think it's the right strategy to to be able to scale. Now it's not going to be for everyone. I think there's going to be always businesses that need a lot of personalization, and that's what separates them from other businesses. Uh, so I think Acumatic will always maintain a segment of their customers that are their you know the ultra power uh, users that are unique and they need that power, but we also have to think about the 90% of our customers who uh, really um, are happy with uh, what's out of the box and they need very li uh, minimal uh, changes and, and options. And if we can address their needs with low-code, no-code, that's the way to go. Right. Ali is a customer who uh, is a yeah, customer part, remember, and uh, you were just talking about uh, being very heavy in coding. Uh, yes. Another part of what you said, we're trying to, to generally shift away from. I can actually, actually parrot exactly what you're saying. Uh, we find that in a lot of cases, although you can set up the ability for, for our, the regular users to be able to, to set their own generic inquiries, for instance, you know, understanding that how the data comes together is really critical to getting information. And just because you can get information and just because it's all from the same database doesn't mean everyone gets the same result if they build it themselves. So we find ourselves actually having to be very careful about what information we make available and how far we allow our end users to be able to do the customizations that Acumatica allows. Because not everyone out there is a power user. Not everyone understands how their work relates to other people's work. And right. so as we get into things that we code very specifically, we love Acumatica as a base. So it provides us lots of great features for inventory management, purchasing, and, and the accounting types of things. But I have to have conversations with our sysadmin on a regular basis. Hey, does this really make more sense to code or does this make more sense to set up with a generic inquiry or for you to be able to do some of the things you do with workflow now? And you know, how hard is it for you to do the things in workflow versus for me to code the workflow? Yeah. And you know, where should we draw those lines? And so those are things that really, again, as a customer doing a lot of heavy coding, we have to have those same types of discussions to figure out, even though we're not trying to provide the software for other people to have to configure, you know, we really have to understand what is the, the nature, not just the need of, of our workforce, but what's the nature of what they will do with what we give them. We have seen for 20 years where if you give them a field and you open it up and they can put whatever they want, you are never going to know what goes in that field until you start looking. And the last plot time you want to do that is when you're sitting with, with uh, one of your customers out there looking at some of that data. And you find words that you never imagined would be in the language of our system. And so sometimes those are just simple misspellings, but it, it yeah. can be very, uh, very funny and challenging. Yeah, yeah but, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we tailor to a very broad audience of users, too. Like we have, you know, tiny kind of customers, you know, 10, 20 employee companies. And then we've got, you know, 10,000 employee companies. So there's a broad set. And when you look at the tiny ones, you know, or, or even the big ones, you know, there's a segment of users who all they want to do is use the system. They don't want to know how it works. They just want to know, let me get my job done, right? So, you know, coding is not for them no matter what. Even low code is not for them, right? They, they're they just highly, you need them highly optimized and focused, and that's why we have role-based, uh, and we can remove functionality they don't need to see and things like that. Then you've got your power users, uh, you know, typically, uh, you know, somebody in the IT staff or somebody like that. But uh, yeah, so those are the guys who we're talking about when we talk about low code, no code. 
and then it goes beyond them because you know the typical you know, IT administrator or what I call the uh, hobbyist type of programmer, um, you know, they can do uh, basic level programming, but they're not going to create nice, uh, you know, structured programming that's scalable, that's main manageable, maintainable, and so on. So you want to give them some power, but you want to put limitations around and fences around what they can do as well. And then you've got your uh, consultant or the you guys who are the resellers who, who really can understand the business process, who can dig into uh, why they need it in the first place, what are they trying to achieve, and is the right way to use low code, no code, or configuration, or code. And then, you know, then there's a, a whole technology debt discussion. That's when you start coding, what does the maintenance look like? Uh, but that's where Acumatica shines, right? The, uh, compared to any other system. That's what we've uh, traditionally focused on is how do we make these uh, upgrades uh, seamless even with that power? And, you know, going back to that, uh, you know, the system being aware of the changes you're making and propagating them from version to version, doing static code you know, analysis, the tools that we now uh, empower you guys with, like the Accuminator and uh, those other types of uh, tools that we do in our test framework and so on. So we continue to invest in those. But realistically, it goes back to that 90% of the people don't need it. One of the things that gets me really excited about Acumatic is the very fact what you just said. It allows the, the, the breadth of the type of customer base that you have. And so I don't have to have my hands cuffed by, say, what Oog needs or what Gerhard needs or what Steven wants to have put in there. And I can still build the things that really make our business uh, function like we have never seen before without having to worry about how I'm going to impact Joe or Terry. Um, yeah. and, and you're able to support all those things, all those different types of people and businesses. And it, uh, there are a lot of things about Acumatica that get me excited. Yeah. That is one of the things that, you know, for 20 years of having to worry about how what I change the system is going to affect everybody else, yeah. it is a phenomenal improvement. Yep, yeah. understood. Great. Good feedback. What else do you guys want to know about? Um, I have one question. Sure. Uh, it's not uh, Acomatica related. It was just uh, hearing you uh, start up with CPM, DOS, and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen a lot of um, technolog technological change, and I was wondering uh, which one of them really hit you as um, a spectacular kind of miracle. Um, I'm going to give you an example. Um, on Windows 3.1, uh, you know, when I first got uh, my multimedia package and I could like watch video on the computer yeah. in uh, full audio, I thought, wow, uh, two years ago, I would not have thought I would have this in my home. Yeah. And But I kind of knew that video, yeah, it was possible. Uh, we, we had it in MS-DOS in some form or another. But when the MP3 hit and the MP4 after, uh, for me, it was kind of magic. I did not understand at first how you could take those 200 megabytes file and uh, compress them to a 20 megabyte. So I yeah. um, was just wondering through the technical technological change, the web or anything, is there something that surprised you along the way that you well, did not think no, that I mean, I, I, you would achieve? Well, I'm a big Star Trek fan, by the way. So, <laughs> you know, everything that they showed, like in even the 60s, you know, with the phasers and the, uh, you know, all the things that they have, the communicators before we had cell phones and, and so on. So, uh, you know, all those marvels are becoming true. I'm still waiting for the trans transporter to become a reality. That, that'll that be the big surprise. That's one that I <laughs> don't know if it'll ever happen, but certainly, uh, but, you know, things like the holodeck I'm looking forward to and, and so on. But, you know, we, we've seen so much, right? And uh, it's just even in the last 10, 10, 10, you know, 10 years. Uh, I mean, just if you go back 20 years, I mean, the iPhone, these phones didn't exist. I mean, this is a, this is a, uh, well, you can't see it, my phone, uh, this thing, it's a marble, right? Our handheld uh, phones are just uh, unbelievable. So that's certainly uh, one of them. But, you know, I I think this whole uh, uh, law of, uh, you know, doubling the capacity every year, computing power getting stronger and stronger, uh, and that continuing to be, be able to hold is a big surprise to me. I thought we would reach 
you know, to a certain place where, you know, you can't, you know, go any further. But, you know, we uh, continue to find and, uh, and show that, you know, chips continue to find ways to go from 10 nanometers to 8 nanometers to 7 nanometers, and then they go vertical with 3D. So, uh, so they continue to uh, build that. But, you know, just imagine, I mean, these uh, you know, micro SD cards uh, and the EMMC cards that you have now hold tetrabytes of data. My gosh, I used to have a 1.2 gigabyte that was this, you know, huge box. And it was like unbelievable that this 1.2 gigabyte drive came out. I mean, we started with megabytes, right? Five megabyte hard drives were astonishing. So I think this whole storage and big data and be able to process the big data uh, in a uh, fast way, I think that's where uh, the golden future is. I mean, because I do believe computing power will surpass our brain capability over the next 10, 15 years. And, you know, once that happens, uh, uh, you know, that that's a big change. And I don't think it'll be just in the software world, you know, uh, the biotech areas, uh, medical, uh, and, and many other fields. Uh, just, you know, in general, you know, those technologies uh, of computing power, uh, I think, uh, have always excited me, and I think it's going to be a revolutionary again. And also nanotechnologies. I, I follow a lot of nanotechnology stuff, and I think, uh, uh, you know, we will have stuff in our bodies, uh, you know, five, ten years down the road that monitor you know, everything that's happening and it's going to be connected to software and everything else that we do. So I, I, I'm, I am looking very forward to, to the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, but I think, I mean, it's kind of proven and it's a prediction by all the industry leaders that, you know, we will advance as much in the next seven years as much as we've done in the last 50. So, uh, you know, put on your seatbelts. <laughs> Uh, interesting. Yes. <laughs> At least uh, I'm glad to hear that the nanobots are not yet inside my body. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. Look at the, look at the, maybe this virus was man-made. I don't want to say conspiracy now. But, well, yeah. I don't think Ali so said it. You know, I trust you, Ali. You're the expert. And, uh, uh, but, one uh, thing I find seen, interesting is that... Garrett. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did not live through the huge computer thing. Uh, my first computer was a microcomputer. The only time I've seen a hard drive uh, was in school and it was a relic. When I say a hard drive, I'm thinking about like the big box. So I find it interesting that you're talking about the SD card because uh, at my age, uh, you know, we, we did not have the USB stick, but we did have the, the diskette. And yes. at that point, we already kind of feel that, okay, we, it's going to be smaller. It's expected that it's going to be smaller. But I, I can realize when you grew up with those huge machine, just the, the size. Punch uh, cards. I used to write punch card code, <laughs> right? So. Yeah. My goodness. IBM O twenty eights with green bars, seventeen inch printers. But, these you know, products. I, but but even you know, I think the there's you know, there's more than just electrons. I mean, I think we're gonna suppress electrons and we'll go to neutrons one day. I know we're going off topic here, but <laughs> anything is game, I guess. But I think when you can create uh, circuits with uh neutrons, I think those will be also game changers in the future for us. Um so I mean we we, we got so much to look forward, but you know, back into the business world, though, I mean, you, you're seeing uh, it goes back to the computing power and 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 data storage because without those, all these other things like ML technology or blockchain or any of these things would kind of be irrelevant. They wouldn't exist if we couldn't uh, process the data. So the more um, those technologies continue to advance as they have been, and they keep doubling every few years. I think that's uh, that's what's going to drive uh, our ability. And you know, in the business world, I do think uh, just like we saw uh, in the consumer world with mobile, how much it changed the day to day on how what we do every day. I mean, we as people, you know, are hooked on our phones and use our phones 
many, many hours a day. If you ask people 20, 30 years ago, will there ever be a day where you spend six hours on your phone? You would say, are you crazy? I will never do that. But yeah, you know, re we, replace we, TV we by it. phone. Right. But I think uh, similarly, we will see a wave like that uh, in businesses where people will interact. The business applications will behave differently. More and more will be done in an automated way. Um, and you, you know, things that you used to do and or you do today, you won't have to necessarily do, you know, uh, in the future. Uh, you know, whether it's your bank statements and reconciliation, or it's your, uh, you know, uh, any of these types of functions that are repetitive, um, you you will continue to shift uh, uh, gears and uh, do less and less, and you're going to go back and look and say, hey, we used to receive faxes, now we don't receive faxes. You, we used to manually enter AP documents, now we don't have to enter AP documents. We used to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. So I think, uh, you know, we'll continue to see areas, and that's exciting because, uh, you know, we're at the forefront of that, and we're always looking. We have a whole team of people at Acumatica that just are thinking about potentially things that people don't even recognize they do. You know, you know, we're talking to customers, but the customers tell us they need X, Y, Z, but you know, they don't have the foresight to think four years ahead of time. What will I be doing four years from now? And so that we're always challenging that team to think about, okay, what is manufacturing going to look like three years from now, four years from now, what pieces, how can we predict uh, capacity uh, planning a little bit better, for example? Is there things we can do from an ML? Do we have enough data? So one of the projects we're working on right now is, uh, you know, anomaly detection is pretty common, but anom anomaly detection across a lot of many different uh, axes. So obviously, obviously there's financials, there's pricing, cost analysis, you know, a bunch of cash flow, you know, lots of uh, areas. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the point is, is, uh, you know, being able to, the, the, the challenges for us right now is always, do we have enough data? Do we have enough data? And with SaaS world, and as we have more and more customers, uh, we're able to uh, see more and more data. And that's what Amazon and Google and those guys and Facebook, and you hear it on the news, right? They control our lives. Um, so I think, you know, the more data we have about how businesses operate and what processes they do and why, um, I think it's going to give us a, uh, head start on what to automate and create new ways if they do stuff. So that's exciting. Ali, uh, I think just from our side also, I mean, talking about blockchain, I think, you know, that's also a very interesting topic and perhaps maybe in the African region, you know, that bug probably start biting us now where, you know, everyone's talking about cryptocurrency, smart contracts, uh, NFTs, uh, particularly around images. So I mean, my thoughts would be, you know, where would you see the whole crypto currency world, the blockchain technology, the NFTs with regards to images or even documents, you know, all, all that type of technologies, how the relationship would work with, with Acumatic in the near future. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a one layer separated from Acumatica currently, right, where, you know, these technologies can already be integrated in Acumatica, as you know. I mean, we, we showed Bitcoin integration like a year after Bitcoin was out. Uh, in one of our summits with John Howe. Uh, but, uh, you know, th I, I think it will become integral. I think that we will see technologies that are that blockchain will be built into the database uh, layer itself. You, you know, you don't even have to necessarily uh, think about it. It'll be behind the scenes that happen. But I do think uh, government organizations um, will, con will uh, support blockchain more and more and integrate it into their processes. So, you'll be forced to use uh, certain, uh, those types of technologies. You know, think about um, countries like Mexico. Uh, you know, they uh, know every, about every ledger transaction that you do. And, but they need a way to audit that and make sure it's accurate and it's fraud proof. So they're perfect applications for uh, uh, blockchain. So I do see blockchain general ledger uh, becoming a, a norm, uh, you know, uh, quite uh, into the future. I don't know what's going to happen in three years or five years or 10 years, but certainly I think uh, uh, governments are going to want to have more control and um, visibility into uh, these areas. And I think blockchain is their way to do that. So. 
and then certainly yes. EDI transactions. You know, EDI is another big mm. uh, area uh, that it's uh, quite uh, interesting when it comes to blockchain. That is it. It's quite interesting. Now, talking about Mexico, we had similar type uh, project that we had to do with Angola, where they are actually focused around the customer invoices and the sequence of it, um, as well as the encryption of the information that needs to be uh, sequentially sent to the government, just to pick up that you know they're not actually sending customer invoices or changing that. So from Mexico to Angola, you know, we had a fairly similar process, and it was actually quite easy to actually build that within Acumatica and then to to uh, automate that that process, so that actually also yeah. <laughs> made our life much easier, especially using Acumatica. Yeah, and there'll be more and more standards, and every country is starting to do something. Even UK, you know, with their MTD now, uh, which is their uh, you know making tax digital. Uh, so now they've got a bunch of rules and reporting things that you have to do. But as more and more regulation comes into play the policing will become a factor. And as policing becomes a factor, then blockchain is where it come, things come in. Thanks. Yep. Anything else? I have a question. Uh, will Acumatica continue to support and maintain those clients who choose to uh, be responsible for their own data? It seems like uh, each year we have a small handful of clients who have their own IT staff and they prefer to uh, uh, have their own infrastructure hosted as opposed to uh, pushing that responsibility back on the cloud. Uh, and and a, also a handful of these customers have mentioned about uh, security breaches within uh, AWS and Azure. So I'm just curious if, uh, you know, Acumatica will continue to maintain and support. It's part of their future, that, like the on-premise. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think um, it's, it's, it's a tough one to answer in, in a short period. We could do a whole hour on this topic alone. But, uh, but basically, the power of choice has always been part of Acumatica's strategy, right? So we want to do what the customers want at the end of the day. So um, if the market continues to say that we need private cloud, we will. Uh, there's no plans to discontinue private cloud by any means. It's continued to be our plan. But we are seeing a shift uh, uh, that more and more people don't want that. Uh, more and more people... Um, don't want to deal with managing. More and more people are worried about the security in-house. You know, no matter what you see with breaches with Amazon or whoever else, uh, uh, that uh, you are much safer in a cloud. Every study has always shown, you know, plenty of them out there, that uh, by order of magnitude, your data is safer um, there than on-premise. Um, but uh, so sometimes uh, we need to educate and continue to educate uh, and provide uh, people those uh, means of, hey, these are the studies and here's why and, and so on, so they understand. But, you know, things like ransomwares are becoming a bigger, bigger, you know, every day something new. I mean, Acumatica has been very fortunate and, you know, we have zero instances, zero vulnerabilities. So uh, we're very proud of that. But to uh, control that in a private setting, we will continue to innovate uh, uh, technologies that help enable that. So Docker technologies, for example, is a big part of that. We've been doing a lot of work with Docker's and containers and 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 trying to enable that for private cloud customers and uh, taking that out of the management so that they can deploy uh, Acumatica in a container type format that's much more controlled and so on. In fact, we're shifting all our uh, Acumatica SaaS environments to container approach over the next couple of years. Um, and we've already started that migration already with, and it's uh, already in testing phases and so on. So um, so we'd like to keep it, but you know, one of the things that's a big challenge that we won't get a chance to talk to when it comes to coding and managing, managing many versions of the product and allowing people the flexibility on stay on all the versions has a enormous giant, uh, um, uh, cost and challenge uh, to continue to do for a very long period of time. So that's why I said I think we would probably realistically over the next you know five years, ten years, three years, 
you will see different product lines from Acumatica. We will have our mainstream product lines, which is that 90% of the people who maybe low code, no code, they can always be on the latest version of the product and so on. That uh, core offering, and it doesn't mean you won't get power and you can't do customization, you will be able to, but uh, you know, we will have, uh, that's a different product and different mindset altogether than the customers that want all the power, they want version control, they want to upgrade when they want to upgrade. Uh, and that has its own set of uh, benefits, right? It has its own uh, drawbacks, but it certainly has its own benefits. So we just need to uh, kind of segregate what the market needs are and be able to articulate and, and put people in the right uh, uh, segment so that they have the right product for them. So we will always have some product offering for both, but will the same offering be there for both people? That's something to be determined. <laughs> All right, anything else from anyone? All right. Well, thank you, Ali. I appreciate you coming on here and uh, spending almost an hour with us uh, answering questions. And and uh, it's uh, great from my perspective to, to learn more about you. I'm sure people here as well, whether they're employees or partners, uh, you know, to have a greater understanding of your background uh, is is really nice to to hear you where you started and and where you've come and your vision and for the company and so forth. So we appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, it was quite a pleasure. Good seeing everybody, and hopefully we'll see most of you at the summit. Yes. Thanks, Bye, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.